Phillies and Mets Saturday, Sunday. Listen to every pitch on 97.3 ESPN. Bob Wankel from RedOctoberPhilly.com and Crossing Broad is back. Red October is back, but the Mets are coming to town. Not ideal, according to a lot of our listeners today. The text board is blowing up with trepidation, Bob Wankel. Uh, do the people on the text board have the right for trepidation, or is this, hey, the hammer and the nail? Phillies are just flat out better than the Mets. <laughs> I'm not going to come on here and do this false bravado thing with you where it's like fills in three and nothing, 10, nothing, 10, nothing. But I think we might be getting a little carried away here with the uh, anxiety and trepidation over the New York Mets. Uh, I'm just going to say this. I, I had this thought late last night and it's like, you know, when on the football schedule, you, you, you peruse the odds on a Sunday morning and you say, I like that underdog to win. And then you kind of get online and you start talking to everyone and everyone likes that underdog to win. And you go, well, oh, wait, they're, they're about to get clobbered then. And I kind of almost feel like that that's what's going on here. Like the Phillies are better than the Mets and they're better than the Mets in every way possible. They have a better bullpen. They have a far superior rotation. They're set up pitching wise better than the Mets. And they were better than the Mets in pretty much every offensive category this season other than home runs. And other than the Pete Alonso home run, the Mets aren't even hitting them right now. So I just, I get it. The layoff, momentum, the 24 Mets or the 22 Phillies. I, yeah, I hear you. But if you're just looking at this, what it is, Phillies are a better team. All right. They are the better team. Record-wise, they were the better team. They played in the season 7-6. I don't know how much factor that is. But we can't deny that there's something about this Mets team that feels like the Phillies. You know, the Phillies against the Cardinals, they're down 2 nothing. Segura squeezes one through. They scored six runs when it felt like they were going to be down in that series and out. And then they make a run to the World Series. So, does it feel like the Mets just have that something, whatever it is? They might not be the better team. I don't know that anybody thinks the Phillies were better than the Braves were in either of those series. But for whatever reason, they just were able to catch a little fire. Do the Mets have that feeling or is that – do they run out of gas? Do they feel like they're running out of gas or – I don't even know about that. So I think one of the, the main questions that you have to ask yourself is what's real and, and what's not. And what's a narrative that we like to create and storylines that we like to create and, and what's what's true and what's real. And for every 2-0 come-from-behind victory that, that propels a baseball team to a long playoff run like you saw with the Phillies against the Cardinals two years ago, there are, there are plenty of other situations. You know, you look at the Phillies' last postseason. Just use the Phillies as an example. Did they have momentum after game two when they destroyed the Diamondbacks heading out west? Sure. Yeah, they had all the momentum in the world, and they were the better team, and they lost. <laughs> Take it across different sports. One of the most improbable endings I've ever seen to an NFL postseason game, the Minneapolis miracle with the Minnesota Vikings and the Stephon Diggs touchdown. Do you know what happened the week after that? You might, because it happened against the Eagles. The Eagles pummeled the Vikings. The, the game after that. It's like we, I think that people are, are on edge because you just watch that team have a, a miraculous moment. And they've had a number of them. And when you're idle and you're sitting on your hands and you aren't having those moments, the only thing that you can do is process what you're seeing and say, oh, damn, I have a lot of respect for what the Mets have done. They got up off the mat. They looked like they were going to have a joke of a season. They made a playoff run. They had a heck of a series in Milwaukee. Lots of late inning dramatics. Credit to them. Well, uh, this idea, though, that, that the Phillies are in trouble because here come the Mets because they hit a, you know, a ninth inning dramatic home yeah. run. I just I can't get behind it, man. Yeah, no, listen, I, I, you know, a lot of people say, well, how come base football teams try to get the bye and it doesn't apply to baseball? Having that week off is not ideal uh, for baseball. Baseball is a game of timing, repetition, uh, muscle memory, and you want to keep playing. Now, I don't know what the Phillies did today. Yesterday, I know they played a simulated game um, Wednesday. Yes. Um, if it were me, I probably would have played a simulated game every day. I, I would have taken live BP. I said I would have called up the the youngest arms I could find that could throw the hardest and just get them up there and say, impress me. Go out yeah. there and make a name for yourself and let them throw three innings apiece against this lineup and let them see like I don't know what they did yesterday. Was it like a – bring your golf clubs and come play top golf at citizens. Bank yeah. Park yesterday Day. was light. And then they had a workout or they're in the middle of a workout uh, right now or about to have a workout this afternoon. So 
look, all I can say is this. I, I don't know how the Phillies, nobody knows how the Phillies are going to respond. And could Brandon Nimmo hit a 14 hopper through the hole and, you know, score two runs in a key situation? Sure. And could Pete Alonso swat a three run homer in the ninth inning and win a game? Yeah, like it's baseball. And the one thing that I think should have fans a little bit nervous, that's fair to be nervous about, that you can really point to, is that anytime you have a shorter series, there's more room and more margin for the unexpected and the crazy to take over. And, and I think that, you know, you get into a short series and it is possible. I'm not saying that the Phillies are absolutely going to win the series. In fact, I think they're going to win it in five games. I think it's going to be a very anxiety fueled couple days here between these two teams. But I just, the Phillies are the better team and I could make the argument. It's not exactly like they ended the regular season guns blazing. This is an older team. It's a veteran team. A reset might not have been the worst thing in the world. If the Phillies come out and score 17 runs the first two games of the series, we're gonna what are we gonna do? Are we gonna talk about the buy that like oh, oh the buy's horrible? Well, we don't know that. Yeah, the well, buy's horrible because the Braves faltered last year. I, I, all the stuff that we can't control. You're right. I mean, the Phillies this week off could be just what the doctor ordered, and the Mets might be running out of gas. Now, some of the questions, one of them has been answered moments ago. Rob Thompson announced Christopher Sanchez will start game two. So I guess the question is, the stats say he should, but are they overthinking this? Uh, all right, so two things. Number one, I think that Aaron Nola in a hostile environment with the with the playoff experience is probably the way to go. I also like the fact that they're b- breaking up the left-handers. I, I think it's, it's good that you're not going Sanchez and Suarez back-to-back, and it's not just about the look. Here you go. You assume that you're going to get a good start from Zach Wheeler in game one. You figure he'll give you length. You don't know that for sure, but that has to be the working assumption. In game two, I think there is trust in Christopher Sanchez, but I wouldn't be that surprised if they treated him much the way that they did against the Diamondbacks last year, which is, here's the ball. I hope this works. If you get yourself into trouble, we'll be very aggressive going to the bullpen. And why I mention that is because then you have a down day between games two and three. So you can go all in with your bullpen in game two if you have to. You get the reset in on Monday. And then you come back and you hope that Aaron Nola gives you that volume again in, in game three, allowing you to be very aggressive with your bullpen again in game four, which you might need to do based on how Ranger Suarez has thrown. So I don't know that it's about home road splits so much as it is about how can we be super aggressive with our bullpen and insulate ourselves against blow-up starts from either Sanchez or Suarez? Yeah, I mean, listen, I- I've been kind of saying you want to put the kid in the best position to succeed for him, knowing that Nola can handle either spot. You put Sanchez on the road, and who knows what could happen. His, his splits, though, have been terrible on the road sure. next to his home splits. And by the way, Sanchez has been exceptional at Citizens Bank Park. So put him in position to succeed as opposed to saying, hey, let's get Nola because he's our number two. I don't think this says that Sanchez is our number two. It just seems it work out better in, in, in this series. Absolutely. And I think for the reasons now, that if they were I playing the, the reasons- Brewers, If they were playing the Brewers, would he throw this number two? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the, he said the other day it was going to be about opponent. I don't necessarily yeah. believe that. I think that it was more about bullpen allocation and trying to protect Christopher Sanchez as much as possible and then relying on Noel's experience on the road. I really think that that's really what this is all about. Uh, Bob Wankel, Red October, Philly.com, and, of course, uh, Crossing Broad, got the Phillies and the Mets for the first time ever. Christopher Sanchez, he will start game two. Wheeler in game run in game one. Uh, it looks like McGill's going to throw for them. What do you think of their pitching situation after all this travel and everything? They're not in a terrible spot, or or do you look at that and say, yeah, maybe they're kind of uh, hitting a tough spot here? Look, I mean, their their pitching's not lined up the way they want it to be. And I think that they have a number of guys that have done a very good job and and to some degree have probably pitched beyond expectation. Um, And and certainly McGill is one of those guys. But here's where the Phillies could have an advantage in game one. And it, it goes beyond the obvious of just saying, you know, Red October and Zach Wheeler. McGill has not uh, exceeded six innings in any start this season. In fact, he's lasted five innings or less in eight of 15 starts. Now, he's been good, and he's been especially good lately. He's made some ch- uh, changes to his pitch mix, and, and I'm not saying that the Phillies are going to come out and just destroy him, but he's not a guy that gives you a ton of length. The, the Mets figure to be tired entering game one, and the bullpen is not particularly good to begin with. And so I think... You know, if you can get him out of the game after four, maybe get him out of the game in the fifth inning, 
they should be vulnerable later in this game. And the Phillies could take advantage of that. So the way I look at tomorrow, like as, as much as everyone wants to talk about momentum and all this and magic pixie dust and all of these other things, <laughs> like look at the odds tomorrow and, and odds makers basically have the Phillies as a, a minus 200 favorite. It's because they have the advantage at the start of the game yep. and they have the advantage at the end of the game and they have home field advantage. Um, it, look, Phillies might lose, and and next week we could be talking about what an epic disaster this was. I'm, I'm not again. I'm not out here saying that that this is a World Series team. I, I don't know, but this is set up very favorably for them. It is. Listen, and I think that's the part of it is that it's set up favorably for you, um, but you're facing the team that you were the year before, right? You, or the last two years, you're facing that team that is kind of that nobody really thought was the better team. Nobody thought the Phillies were better than the Braves last year or the year before. Uh, and part of the part, the thing with the Braves that has been their problem against the Phillies during the regular season, you got nine guys that can mash. Well, you're facing the Royals and the pirates and the, you know, whatever's four and five starters in a series and you're piling up runs against them. When you're facing good pitching every day. So, this Phillies lineup, is in the end that going to be a strength or weakness for them? Do you think that this lineup finally gets it done? You're going to face a lot of good pitching in the postseason. So, I just don't know that they're going to average seven runs per game and mash their way to a title. But I guess I expect... I, I guess I expect them to swing the bats. I, I guess I expect them to be a little bit more competitive. There's going to be a boomer bust element to what they do. But I do think for as as much credit as the Mets deserve and, and as, as deep as they've been in that rotation, I mean, it's like four guys, none of which when you look at them, you say like, oh, I'm, I'm scared of this guy, but they go out and do it. I still think that the Phillies are going to have opportunities to, to score runs in these in these games. And I don't know. I mean, it's a, the saying is an offense going to score six and a half runs per game versus three runs per game. Like there is an element of un, uncertainty and there's a, you know, a unpredictable nature to this whole thing, especially over a five game span. But I just think that there's enough there. I, I don't know what the NLCS looks like, whether it be the Padres or Dodgers. And I, I like I said, I think that this series is going to go the distance. But I think that there's enough there to to take care of business and then kind of reset and see where you're at after this. All right. Uh, I'm trying to see in real time here. I know that Thompson uh, is talking. I don't know that if he's played it. He did announce Sanchez will start. I have not seen uh, him mention what he will do with his lineup. But what what should he do with the left field, center field situations. You got uh, a couple lefties that will pitch in this series. They've got Manaya, they've got Quintana, uh, Peterson. You got three lefties that you could potentially see in this series. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think what I would do tomorrow is is probably with Wheeler on the mound and saying, like, this is going to be about run prevention. I, I probably would put Brandon Marsh in left against McGill and I would I would probably put Johan Rojas in center field tomorrow. I don't know that that Austin Hayes is necessarily warrants a, a start here in this this first game. Um, you know that I've I've got major concerns and reservations about Johan Rojas's game offensively. Um, some of the base running stuff actually makes me pretty nervous too in a playoff series. But I think for game one, that's probably the best option. But when you talk about getting the Mets versus getting the Brewers, certainly you know, this is probably going to neutralize Brandon Marsh a little bit early on in games. Like, I don't know that you see Brandon Marsh against the Quintanas and the Petersons and the Manias. And I also don't know exactly, and I guess I'm curious to see what Rob's saying in real time right now, how they they handle Bryson Stott at second base. I mean, does Edmundo Sosa get some starts against these lefties? And I, I think that that's very much going to be one of the things to keep an eye on. Yeah, here. I was going to say, how much of a possibility do you think that is? That they really, one year ago today, Stott hit a grand slam off a lefty. Uh, since that moment, not so good against left-handed pitching. Do we really think if there's a lefty that Ed, uh, Edmundo Sosa is in that lineup? Yeah, you know, how they approach a game one, they might just roll out the lineup and say, these are our guys, let's go get it. Um I think that they certainly I, here's all what I can say. I know for, for sure that they very much have considered this. You know, I think that Immuno Sosa is going to play a significant role in this series. Um, whether or not he starts game one, I don't know, but I would expect him to get a start or two at some point here. 
That would be interesting because Stott was, you know, by the way, people forget Stott hit in the five hole last year in these playoffs, right? He was in the <laughs> fifth. And now he's hitting towards the bottom and might not be in the lineup. They're going to go Castellanos four, Bohm five. I, I think they were leaning that way. I mean, it seems like that's kind of where the indications are pointing. Um, you know, there's obviously boomer bust potential there. I, I think, though, that given, given Castellanos' second half, really since the middle of May, he's, he's been pretty good. He gives you that veteran presence, and he can do some damage, and it's not perfect. I mean, I think that the, the cleanup spot last year was what killed the Phillies in the postseason, and if you talk about the lineup and concern about their offense, I think it's this cleanup spot again that you have to kind of circle and just say, oh, cross your fingers and hope it works out. I agree. Um, big picture here. This crew, this group, is this the last shot for them? Yeah. I know I, contractually I could... it might not be the wor- the, the last shot because you do got guys signed after this year, but do they have to <clears throat> look at themselves if they come up short again and say, now we have to try to do something different? Yeah, so I would be stunned if the Phillies didn't have two new starting outfielders next year. Um and, and that might involve Nick Castellanos. I don't think that that's obvious, uh, but I think there is a world with two years left on his deal. I think that his numbers were good enough and his consistency was really good enough after the first month that a team might not have a ton of reservations about saying, like, let's bring this guy in here for two years around $20 million. Um, it's possible, but I certainly think that in some way, shape, or form, there's going to be two new outfielders out there for the Phillies. I don't think you're going to get this Rojas Hayes combination coming back, and I think that that's the most obvious place to upgrade. And I also believe that you have to consider, and I know some fans, and I think I might have suggested this to you previously, and I think some fans are going to say, like, really? But I, I think that there is a world where you have to consider Stott and Bohm and, and taking one of them and and moving on. Um, I just don't think there's enough power in, in this in this lineup. You have some guys that are aging. You know, Castellanos is probably a 20-homer guy. Real Muto is maybe a 15-homer guy at this point. I just feel like Stott and Bone don't supply enough power. Yep. And I think that you have to consider what you have and where does Aiden Miller factor into this thing and – I, I just don't think that both of those guys are back next year. We'll say. Yeah, I, I, I wonder. That's why, again, the pressure of this group, knowing that they brought them all back and knowing that if they don't get it done, that this could be it for them together, Marsh, and, and um, you know, figuring out what to do with that situation in left field all year long again. You know, we'll see what ends up happening. But it all starts tomorrow, and you can listen to it on 97.3 ESPN. Here's the question. Ninth inning, one-run game, who's getting the ball? Uh, one run game. Well, they probably already used Strom and they probably already used Hoffman. And so it's going to be a Stevez. And uh, that is one of the things we did not get to in this conversation. You said, what's one thing that gives you a lot of concern, a lot of pause? <laughs> well, I mean, could it they, that. could they go to Hoffman? Yeah. If, if I had, if I just had my pick, if my starter gave me eight innings and I had a one, nothing lead in the ninth, I would go to Hoffman every day of the week. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just – I don't feel great about a Stevis either. But I, I don't feel great about a closer against a team that's willing to shorten up and use all fields uh, that, that can't miss bats. And he's just not missing enough bats. Uh, you know, he's striking out less than nine for nine uh, with the Phillies. Um, the walks are up a little bit. It's just – it's a little bit of a concern. So. Yeah, I, I when they made the trade for him, that was one of the things I said. I said, he's not a big strikeout guy. It's different trying to get the last out in this place tomorrow. I mean, he's going to look up in that crowd and it's going to be a different scene than uh, the ballpark in Anaheim. I mean, it's going to be something, man. Yeah. I mean, he's a good arm. He's not, this is not 2023 Craig Kimbrell. I mean, I don't, not to say that the same thing couldn't happen, but he's certainly a better pitcher than that guy was, but yeah, I I have some concerns there. All right. Uh, Well, we'll listen to it tomorrow right here on 97.3 ESPN Sunday at four Saturday at four, both games. And uh, Monday we will be recapping all the mayhem. I'll tell you what, uh, the Eagles, who are kind of under the radar right now with the Phillies, they're probably happy. But if the Phillies go out early, the pressure will double on that team. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Sirianni's hair is going to be totally wiped by kickoff Jeez. against the Browns. All right, man. We'll see you. All right, man. See you later. Bob Wankel, uh, Red October Philly is the newsletter.